businesswoman South Africa takes on a census every year. Uh, as you can see, the numbers from 2009 to 2010. Um, but there's a shortage of effort in terms of explaining the numbers. I believe that there is a need for qualitative research to explain the numbers. The research though, when you ask why, my partner and I, Utemi Sabachel and I, for our MBA thesis, focused on women in leadership. She focused also on executive leadership. I focused a lot on women on board. But also because we get engaged very often in August around Women's Month, we were so tired of complaining about the numbers. So we wanted to understand the message behind the numbers. Our research brought out, which has been also in other research, that representation of women in leadership would multiply exponentially if women were readily, readily able and willing to collaborate. But we also looked at the trends internationally, not just in South Africa. We started seeing that there's relative stagnation because if you look at that slide, look at 2009 to 2012, we're just hovering. And we've been hovering around that since the 2000s. And we're playing catch up because a lot of this progress started post 1994. But we've all just gotten to a level and we don't seem to be moving. And this is an international trend. The only countries that are bucking the trend are the countries that have a quota system. And that's usually the Scandinavian countries. They have targets of 40% representation in leadership and um, special board level listed companies and they're already, already exceeding some of those targets. So we were a bit concerned that despite the growing number of educated women entering the workforce, their increasing buying power and influence Women continue to hold small proportion of leadership positions in business, particularly because government has been very uh, effective in effecting their change, but business has lagged behind. So this is the rationale that formed our focus on networking. And it's also because it does tend to be a loosely used term and we wanted to probe more. So in terms of um, the research, 48% were females, 52 were males. This is strictly board level executive directors and executive management. One of my favorite question, because I wanted to understand that maybe uh, we're just not interacting with each other. I wanted to know, do you network with the opposite sex? All of, hey. <laughs> Both, um, uh, both males and female, 100% uh, said we do. One of the questions was, are men better at networking than females? Because I thought maybe that will explain why we are not moving. Females, 38% say yes. No, 38% of men say yes. Men are better, but females, say so 87% of females say, yes, men are better at networking. Is that maybe where the problem is? So just, I'm not gonna run through all of it in the interest of time. I will put some on the website. It's already on the website if you want to log on, www.musaraleadershippartners.ca.za. You can download it, it's already there. The research came up with so much material that we've decided to split it into two parts. We decided to be opportunistic because we realized with the NEF and now again with the IEC chairperson's issues that there is something we are missing in this country with regards to issues of conflicts of interest which some of our research bore out. So we are releasing the results in phases. So this one focuses strict, strictly on the governance aspects, which we've called networking governance. Part two is more strategic in terms of the principles, and we will be talking about that next year. The one thing um, that I realized from the research is that the exceptions have become perceptions. Why we have a negative connotation towards the word networking is because the negatives 
of what we think networking is. It's socializing, it's manipulating, it's fake, it's schmoozing. So people actually do not want to say they do networking and they don't think it's a positive association. So I, I really just wanted to make sure that we were talking about the same thing in terms of starting off from the common definition of what I thought networking was. So I did ask everybody to define, but the best defini definition um, that encompasses what all the respondents said is networking is building relationships before you need them then when you need them, you know whom to call and he or she will want to help you. And that's very key. So whatever you want to call networking, this is what, even if you call it relationship building or connection, this is the essence of what this research was about. I will just run through just some of the key wisdoms uh, because there were many. Uh, the, f the first one is that we do it network network networking consciously and unconsciously. It's you can you actually born networking from day one. You can inherit <laughs> your networks. That's what that's what you do. We know that surnames are very important. This is why sometimes you will get an appointment just based on your surname. Mm -hmm. It is meaningful relationship building over time. It is reciprocal, it's a give and take, it fosters trust, it makes NetBank, not NetBank, for one of our speakers from NetBank, NetBank deposits, and results in genuine depth of knowledge of the other person. The part we getting into trouble for is the short termism. You want your immediate effort recognized, so you want things under the table. So if I do this for you, you pay me under the table. But when you understand it's a long-term investment, you will not be pushing for under the table. Secondly, social capital is the strength of the relationship. Very key. Actively pushing somebody's agenda needs you to have something invested in that person. Yeah, you're pushing the agenda of someone else because they emotionally you have emotionally bought into who they are and their dreams and where they want to go to. That's key. That's a fine balance though when it comes to governance because you have to understand what good corporate governance is even when you're trying to push somebody's agenda. The third one uh, was that men do seem to be better at networking. But that also, when I probe this more, it's more about styles, not that they necessarily better at networking. And men invest time. Women don't have the time, so it's like a spray and pray approach. Whenever they have time, when they socialize, it's not strategic. That's the second part of the research we're going to be releasing next year, about the strategic parts of networking. Um, and the long term and the constant interaction, which men are good at, we know that sometimes out of sight, out of mind. It's true. So when you interact with somebody, often, when you hear of a deal or you hear of an opportunity, the person who comes top of mind for you is the person that you're most likely to be interacting with most, most uh, frequently. So men have time to invest. One of our respondents, a female CEO, said they have a wife. They do not have the guilt of spending five hours on a golf course or going to the bush for the weekend, building meaningful relationships. I need a wife who looks after me, except me. <laughs> the next key wisdom we got was the strength of networking, as in, in every relationship, is about honesty. That came out very strongly. I think the fake society sometimes is getting everybody down, and they're tired of being manipulated. So the, 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 the core principle that came out was uh, it has to be rooted in honesty. You, I understand why you need something from me. Tell me, don't, don't insult me and act as though you want something more than what I know you want. Just be open with me. Um, a particular C, uh, CEO said it's insulting to lie and say you, want, you would love to have lunch with me. Respect my intelligence. Tell me what you want and ask if we can discuss it over lunch, but don't say I would love to have lunch with you. <laughs> The, f the final key wisdom that I want to draw out, which, as uh, my colleague has said, 
has sparked quite a number of excitement um, is the sexual tensions between and differences. It seems like we stuck on the tensions, but they forgot that we said differences <laughs> as well uh, between men and women. Um, there was a tape I was going to show you, but in the interest of time, I'll show it later, maybe during that, that captures this. Few, uh, there are very few women in leadership, as we all understand, and they have low levels of power in comparison to men, and thus their impact is less. But on balance, women do become co-opted rather than transform the status quo. So both sexes are complicit in perpetuating the equal playing field. Because of the differences, we try and fit in, and we try to be men, and we really shouldn't. Um, so we, instead of changing things, we don't want to rock the boat and, and we end up leaving things as they are. Also, there's a concept called the class network. In our 16th of May um, seminar, we had um, Dr. Roseanne from um, New Zealand who actually did the research on that and it's a new concept, the class network. Remember we have the glass ceiling, now we have the class network. Because that ceiling, the people that have managed to come to that ceiling have formed their own network. Um, it's invisible. Um, so recruiting directors by shoulder tapping and preferring to select people of similar backgrounds because we minimizing, minimizing risk has given a rise of the familiar old boys network even amongst women. So the same women have multiple seats. So we're perpetuating the same thing. <coughs> In memory of Mr. Lodden Glovo, who was also a mentor of mine, um, this point kind of took me back to, I interviewed him for my MBA research in 2006, and I remember him saying, did you, I find it very difficult to refer women to, on, on boards, and I was like taken aback, and he says, um, it's high risk for me, because if they don't perform, it reflects on me. So if I don't know you, I don't kind of, and if you don't interact with the other sex, then you don't know them well enough. So at that time, I was a bit <coughs> upset with him. Um, but when I read this again, you understand that um, there's a high risk and you really, you really want to um, refer people that you know. So the, the shoulder tapping is also something that women get into. Men are also largely blind or intolerant to the disadvantages women still experience at home and work and the benefits that uh, still accrue to men. One male um, CEO said, I don't believe that it's true that women are restricted in their ability to network. Why can't they come to the bush? Reasons are not insurmountable. Women need to compromise. They must organize their lives. And then in the next breath, he says, um, it's important that women maintain their femininity and their role in the family environment. <laughs> the structure of the home is under threat. He did realize at the end of the interview that he is contradictory. And he was very sorry because he says, I have gold children and I'm not aware that I'm actually perpetuating. And he says, I thought I've given my children all the advantages, but from your research, you're telling me that they are just gonna have as much difficulty as your generation. So if nothing else, the 31 powerful people we spoke to, at least they're gonna change their ways. <clears throat> Women suffer from massive guilt, from taking time out, which is something that women really um, need to uh, work on. During the same years that their careers demand maximum time investment, that's the biology, uh, their biolog biology demands that they have children. Uh, one female CEO said, we need to show the world that we are able to be more excellent. We have failed to shine. We stop shining in, in the business environment when we fall pregnant. I wanted to change the world. I had babies, then everything went out the window. Because for so many years I had to raise children, so the energy I had left was to raise my babies. Also, partners do not share the housework and child rearing equality. None of the respondents captured this for me, but there's a book, Lin In, which I have been reading, and um, the writer captures it. And she says, in the last 30 years, women have made more progress in the workforce than in the home. 
a better world is one where half of the institutions are run by women and half of our homes are run by men. And I think she captured that. Okay, I need to hurry up. Um, women can be very good at networking, but the circumstances don't allow them to. Um, I think we kind of spoken a bit about that, so we can move on. There is a saying that it's not what you know. Um, oh, okay, let me just clarify. This is now the end of my top five networking wisdom. Uh, you can read more about them. Um, oh, okay, I have to because our media loves this one. Um, um, the idea that um, the the misinterpretation of the differences in women, which brings on the tension. And it was great that it was volunteered. I didn't, I didn't state it first. The black male volunteered that view that women open up easily compared to men. Women have a social rapport. Because it's easier to talk to them, men sometimes misinterpret this as a sign of weakness. Men can take advantage of a woman by saying she's falling for me. Men take it as flirtation. To them, openness equates to I'm interested beyond the business situation, which I thought was kind of interesting because many stories have been had around the table when women are together about this very same issue. A white male also shared this perspective. Women sometimes end up not going to social networking functions. My female colleagues come back to the office in tears saying that men are making unwanted advances. They are making it difficult for women to network. And this is not just a South African problem. Um, though this particular respondent said he thought that in South Africa is more rife than in other countries, especially the US. He said the US women have taught men their place because they sue them. The minute you <laughs> harass, harass her, she takes you to court. So she thought in South Africa we haven't come to the same enlightenment. So those were the top five um, that I wanted to draw out. But just going to the close, what is the upside? I think we all appreciate the upside. There is a saying that it's not what you know, it's who you know, which is why one of our topics today is about that. The reality is that though it is important to work hard at your own endeavor of choice in terms of what you know, it's not enough to maximize one's potential. The reality is that the leader's value in the business environment depends on what they can do for people. That is the reality of it. All the interviewees contributed, um, who contributed attributed their achievements to the quality and the reciprocity of their networks. Networks deliver these unique advantages to competitive private information, which is why we have rules against insider trading. Yeah? The reality is that if you have well-connected people, they will have private information that gives you the edge. Access to diverse skills. My being here is also a testament to that, that you have people that you can call upon. And most importantly, it gives you power, the ability to influence. So, which is why the quality of your networks are very key in terms of the ability to influence. There are people who are complaining that I have all these business cards but nothing is happening. That's because it is not about the quantity, it is the quality. And just in closing, the downside, which is part of why we're here, I believe that we all have a personal balance score card. It influences our finance, our income, the principles and values of the laws that we comply with, the, the de development in our knowledge, the networks and relationships, and it's all grounded on a reputation and brand. And any of those are in out of sync, you are in trouble. That is the downside. The upside is when all these things are working together, which is why we all hope that there's still ways of making money in a legal way. Yeah using your networks, developing, using the knowledge you have, and enhancing your reputation and brand. 
if any of those are out of sync, you're in trouble. This is why we are here. The Wayne, one male CEO said, if you've done a good job at networking, that means you, you have a, a, you've got a lot of friends, contacts, and associates. If you are in business, because, because of the strength of your network, you can bring opportunities to the business and the company. You can be conflicted because a, sexual, a, a social element is part of networking. So do you walk away from opportunities? Because life is not simple, there are cases and situations where one will get support from a family member or a connection, which will be perceived negatively. But if it is disclosed up front and there are no secrets, then it should not be an issue in my opinion. And that's what we're gonna to interrogate today. Is it just about disclosure? Can you always give business to your relatives? And just because you've disclosed, is that okay? In closing, I believe that good judgment comes from competence and character. Competence comes from being knowledgeable. Knowledgeable about good principles, governance principles, your legislation, ethics, whatever the case is. And your character, it's your principles and your values. And with that, you're able to make good judgment. So judgment in terms of ethics legislation and your common sense. So hopefully we are here to sharpen our judgment. So let's listen, reflect, and enjoy each other. And um, yeah, it's taken a while.